Hello everyone and welcome back to The Red Path. My name is Dara and in today's episode of Competitive Insights, we are going to be diving really deep into the balanced data slate and how it affects the world leaders. I'm joined by two very special guests to discuss the most impactful changes for our army going forward. So grab yourselves a brew and let's dive into the video. Hello everyone and welcome back to The Red Path. I am joined today by uh, two wonderful guests. We have my arch nemesis, uh, sometimes bandmate, sometimes friend, Dan, better known in the Discord as Iron Dan. And we have Brian, better known as Rune in our Discord as well. Two of our wonderful patrons and I would say um, influential members of the various competitive chats in our Discord channel. Um, there's been a lot said over the last week and I thought I'd get these two folks on to talk about the balanced data slate, which has changed things up for the entire, I suppose, competitive game of Warhammer, um, and especially for the world leaders as well. So we're going to talk today um, in depth about the changes to the world leaders, how it's all going to play out, and how things are going to go moving forward. Um, we're going to start things off, though, with a little bit of introduction. Dan, why don't you say hello to everyone here? Sure. Hey, everyone. Nice to see you. So as Dara said, those of you who know me in the Discord, I'm Iron Dan. Tend to be more of a casual player, not tournament level, but most of the games that I do play in are semi-competitive. Most of the people that I do play against are very competitively minded people. And um, there's a few people at my local club that do like to, to go full hog and rank quite decently. So the people that I play against do tend to, you know, give me a good battering when I ask them to. So I'm excited and happy to get onto these changes and hopefully we'll uncover some hidden gems that we didn't think of before. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Brian, uh, welcome back. You know, not your yep. first time here. No, nope, uh, good to be back. Uh, thanks for having me on again, Dara. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Brian Doherty. I live out in the great Midwest of uh, the United States, uh, great state of Michigan. I'm uh, a pretty sweaty uh, competitive player. Uh, when it comes to 40k, I love my events. Some would but... say the best world leader player in the world. <laughs> uh, sheepishly, yeah. I mean, best in faction, WCW. Um, uh, that I know that's one, one, one event. So don't chalk too much up to it. But uh, I did get to claim that title for a little bit. Um, I definitely uh, am still a casual player too. I do like my big 4,000, 5,000 point games. I'm keep bashing up 10 world leader terminators right now. And I'm even pulling out my corn demons right now to get them all painted up because I think they're actually pretty saucy at the moment too. Yeah, for sure. For um, sure. So thanks for having me on Dara. I'm happy to yeah. be able to give some input. It's going to be great. Um, we're going to start things off with a little bit of a, an overview of the, the entire um, slate as it was before diving really deep into the world leader changes. But we're going to talk about um, what armies we think really kind of came out as winners from this, what armies maybe got nerfed, but are still going to be seen a lot at the top tables. So um, yeah, let's let's kick this one off anyway with uh, some of these changes. So there's obviously been some fairly significant faction changes. I guess the big talking point here is Craftworld, Eldar, and Chaos Space Marines, both of whom were, were top of the competitive scene for a substantial period of time, but both have seen um, hefty enough nerfs, I would say. It's kind of interesting. I think Chaos got a little bit more gutted than um, Craftworld, Eldar did. I think there's a lot of depth in the Craftworld book that we're still going to see kind of rising up. You know, a lot of people are talking about the Yinkarn being, being maybe not a takeable option anymore, but I think that kind of might just leave some Craftworld players with 350 odd points of other really good units that they're going to bring in instead. And I personally think the Age of the Fire Dragons is probably on the horizon for us. But uh, yeah, what do you guys think? Let's uh, we'll kick it off with you, Brian. How do you feel about these these changes to these two meta armies? I think personally, neither of both of them got hit. Neither of them are going anywhere. Um, I still think they're going to be dominating tables. I don't think they're going to be. Uh, bludgeoning everybody and winning seven out of eight events every weekend but chaos space marines i mean i played them for a little bit at the start of the edition they have so many strong data sheets that they're just going to fall back on i mean abaddon and ten boys uh walking around is still pretty good uh chosen are still very playable um i will say that i think they're a lot more manageable of a matchup now just because accursed cultist bricks 
um, getting yeah, hit as they, hard as they did. <laughs> they got hit pretty hard. The accursed cultists. You just, <laughs> you just couldn't. There was very little play into them, right? Like yeah. you had a couple answers, and if you just whiffed, you were done. Versus now, Chaos Space Marines were still going to be pretty strong, but uh, we can scrap with them a little bit more. I feel like, um, definitely a little bit more of a back and forth rather than a brick wall, uh, yeah. is what that felt like. Uh, Eldar, like kind of like you said, Dara, they lost three hundred a three hundred and fifty point model. And I think they're just going to take Falcons and Fire Dragons and all of their other good overtuned fast units that are great at scoring and still lethal. Yeah, we got um, Sweeping Hulks coming out of the wings now. You know, and Shadow Spectres are still amazing. Um, Warp Spiders didn't get touched. They were, nope. I would say, arguably one of the best infantry units in the entire game. Um, and I think, yeah, when you talk about scoring, like their lethality maybe isn't isn't so crazy anymore, but their ability to score hundreds in your standard game of, of 40k is is very, very prevalent. And I think, you know, maybe there's a bit more of a skill check to playing Craft World Elder now, you know, but I, I still definitely think I will be seeing them rise to the top. Which is which is good. And with their the thing that has them up above all other factions, in my opinion, is their point scores are good enough, like hammer pieces too. Yeah. Like they, they're yeah. still very they still can put out a lot of damage. Absolutely. While also running up the points, and I think we're, I, I think we're just going to see the Avatar of Cain, some transports and fire dragons and warp spiders and everything we've been seeing, but more. Yeah, Dan, how are you feeling about those, uh, those two faction changes? Yeah, I, mean, I won't spend too long on it. I think I pretty much would just echo everything that you've said. I think the only other thing that I would add there is that the armies that I think we're going to see go to the top is obviously. It's no surprise to anyone, Necrons are probably going to be up there purely because either GW are waiting to see what happens and then maybe they'll bring out a, a slate for Necrons if you know things don't get paired back, I don't know. Um, but I think the main armies, again, Eldar, Necrons, CSM, Dark Eldar possibly, they're all books that have quite a depth to them. And as we've just said, they probably won't struggle to find things that will, even if they don't do the same things they did to the same level, They'll be able to fall back on things which you know maybe pull 50 to 75 percent of what they were doing and that's really the benefit of armies like that that yeah. have a good a good breadth of of unit variety so yeah i can't say i disagree on any of those points to be honest with you yeah it's an interesting one the dark elder especially like i mean if they kind of become prevalent which i suspect that they'll they'll be they will we'll, we'll see them a lot but i don't think they're going mm. to necessarily be the easiest army to pilot to a gt no. win um but i think we will find them lurking in that kind of like three and two four and one bracket mm. very very regularly which tends to be where the world leaders fall a lot of the time as well so i can see them being quite a regular opponent for us and i think that is sort of informing the decision at least of some of the lists that i'm making a lot these days kind of considering mm -hmm. okay how am i going to adapt to dark elder being there an awful lot of the time because you know there's a lot of dark elder players around there as well and this is the first time i think that they can really contend with a lot of the armies in 10th edition so people are naturally going to be very excited to get that army back out on the table you know um so mm -hmm. we're going to see that initial rush at least in the first three months where where people are really excited to try some new things and like you say there's there is a deep index there that they can draw upon. Um, and there's just lots of moving parts. I think it is a very unforgiving army, even with the new detachment. Mm -hmm. I think if you misplay your go turn with this army, um, the wheels come off the bus and the bus falls out of the sky. And it's it's a really bad vibe for them. But yeah, I, I can't really disagree about the Necrons. Um, I can see them kind of really being a dominant force. But I don't necessarily think that the world leaders have the worst game into the necrons i think maybe our worst game is still potentially the craft world elder because i mean the night spinner is still a, a very oppressive unit for us even though it got a little bit of a nerf and a little bit of a points boost um i know brian we were talking about this even earlier today they they probably didn't go far enough with the night spinner mm -hmm. right i think they i don't know the, the points increase is definitely gonna hurt uh, if eldar chooses to play the same list they've been playing and uh I'm I, I'm no Eldar expert, but say sub the Incarn for the Avatar, and we're just doing the one Avatar and everything else. Three Night Spinners in the back. I mean, their army just went up a hundred points. They got to cut more scoring units, which that army was already pretty low on units. I just don't see Eldar playing three Night Spinners currently. Mm -hmm. um, again, I could be wrong. Um, one Night Spinner, 
two night spinners, I could see that. I think they're definitely going to at least take a step back. I would have loved to have seen Twin Linked go away personally, or mm -hmm. the No Advance, um, but like make it all the movement blocking part of it gone. Maybe just minus two. I wouldn't like them touching Advance at all. Yeah, because um, yeah. I mean, now, netting I minus four to a move thing to to note on the on the advance roll um, that maybe world leader players haven't necessarily clicked with yet. So I think it's a, a little bit of a PSA. But um, if you use the one CP stratagem to auto six advance, that is not modified by the night spinner because it modifies advance rolls, and that is not an advance roll. You just move six, so that mm -hmm. won't take that two away. So there's a little bit of tech there for like, okay, this unit has been hit by the night spinner. Maybe that's the unit that I use the CP for the the six inch advance. But you know, if you don't have advance and charge up, you're still taking a minus two move, minus two charge bonus as well, which is actually quite quite rough. Like they didn't have that <laughs> minus two charge it, bonus before this, but now they do. I'm like, do they get buffed? <laughs> you know? and I think I think one thing that that opens up, and this is the good thing when these shakeups happen, is that a lot of people have slept on the Juggalord for a while, and I think that. If you are still going to see units like that, then um, one of the things that I'll talk about later is you know what changes that could come out of the data slate that maybe we haven't seen before is that I think there's going to be a rise in things like minuses to move and things like that because now abilities stack. That also includes psychic powers. And right. there's a oh, few no. of them. Does that stack? Yeah, Does that minus four it's, move? It's under abilities, yeah. And so I think the Juggalord, mm -hmm. if you attach that to a squad of Exalted Eight Barons, you know, he's just the full hog, the whole six. I think having two bricks, one with Invo, one with the Juggalord, you auto six one. And then, sure, if you're going to get hit by the Night Spinner, at least you've got the Juggalord to fish for those higher advanced rolls. So you're not just yeah. stuck going, okay, I've rolled a four, I've got a two. That's it, the unit's done. So yeah. I think it, we might see the rise of him being slotted into more squads, but time will tell. It makes sense, I think, yeah. It I'm not speaking from just a purely biased point of view as the advance and charge army of me hating night yeah. spinners, but I, I've watched, I've watched my teammate here uh, up in our local club. He plays chaos knights. Just be absolutely miserable with his night oh, rampager, just yeah. not going anywhere. Yeah, as it's, it's an advance and charge model, and it goes through walls, and it's like it doesn't have enough movement to get through the walls now, and it's just oh, it's just five hundred point models, wall, you know, standing there <laughs> like it's rough. Yeah, um. Yeah, so they're, they're the kind of main armies that we think might be rising to the top. And I, I suppose before we kind of dive too deep into this, like, it is important to say and, and to kind of caveat that, like, while we might be talking about, about nerfs and, you know, maybe slightly negative things that have come out of this balanced status later, things which could be perceived as negative, none of the three of us are really feeling like our army is in what I would call, like, a bad place right now. Yeah. You know, we're, we're still positive about where things are um and while yeah the nerfs hurt a little bit you know there's there's still room for innovation and room for for placing quite well at, at competitive events but i think one thing um that really pulls at me from this balanced data slate is the amount of armies that are going to be kind of fishing around in that four and one category now because i think there's like you know death guard i, I feel like are a real big winner here mainly mm -hmm. because they didn't really get nerfed typhus oh. from ten and points you know it's uh there's some scary stuff there for sure. PPC is going to 180 though. I think there's now a debate to maybe not three in a list. Yeah, I can definitely see that. two. I, um, I know. I played against a Death Guard list at uh, Glass City GT, and I can say that list I think went up like 150 points. Oh wow, really? Um, like their Oof. their their nerfs are quite invisible. I feel mm. like Nurglings going up 10 points each. Yeah, they were true. playing two to three squads, in kind of like the mental mindset of death guard players was to be running either mortarian or three brigands which also went up 10 points each and then plague marine spam isn't as great i think death guard's still just fine mm -hmm. oh yeah they're definitely they, they're back to the drawing board too i feel like cutting in some a way things. i think yeah yeah bearing in mind though morty's changes became official Mm, yeah. So I think that there's now a big argument for the lists that weren't running Mortarian, which admittedly I don't think there was many, but I think much like where we cement Anglon into our our list, I think Death Guard very much now cement um Morty into their list, especially again with things like Night Spinners and things like that still being prevalent. That ignoring modifiers is it's yeah. just enormous. Yeah. I could I could see them really you know, thrashing it out with us in that same kind of category mm -hmm. for an average mm -hmm. GT player. And I think likewise, Custodes are, are going to be in that category too. Votan, Votan are going to kind of 
I think, float between mm. that and actually winning GTs because they got some points increases for sure. But, you know, yeah. so did a lot of other armies and, and they were they had so much stuff on the table. And I think now they will just be able to out volume and outnumber a lot of armies in the game. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, the, the Dark Elder, obviously, it's going to flip very much on the player skill. So I think that area at a GT where we like to kind of play that high three into low four and one, possibly even challenging the actual GT win. I think that is a very crowded field after this balanced mm. status which is kind of cool yeah, because it is. It you're going to get a lot more variety when you're going into, we'll say your game five and you're, you know, either four and oh or three and one. Um, normally at that stage, previously, I'm like, okay, cool. I'm going to be playing either CSM, Necrons or Eldar. Now, I think it could be a lot of other different armies, which I suppose from a, a meta standpoint, at least for me, I'm happy about that because there's variety there, you know? Yeah. I don't think the game is necessarily been in an unhealthy state for a while i think that obviously the start of 10th it was very much like the okay corral but yeah. they've gw you know for all the supposed sins they have i think they did a decent job of curtailing most stuff and they just kind of had to let it sit out for another six months to see how it panned out and i don't really think that the meta is going to be in a horrible state and like you just said i think it's opened up enough that it's going to evolve into something which is new and interesting as opposed to just being it's just CSM and Eldar, but just with a little less win percentage. So, yeah, yeah we'll see. Yeah, I definitely think there's going to be more armies that will be able to challenge for that top spot. And to caveat, before we dive into the world leader stuff, I, I think that, you know, a decent player um, and the right list is definitely still going to be able to challenge for GT wins and possibly major wins um, for the world leaders. But yeah, Brian, how are you feeling before we move on to the world leader changes about all that? Uh, for just our prospects moving forward, just generally. Yeah. Um, I think our army, uh, has a lot of tool, or it doesn't have a lot of tools, but the tools that it does have are still very strong. Um, I know the nerf to Mo is kind of a gut punch for some people, but I feel like some world leader players were just getting away with the fact that he just was a catch all, yeah. kill anything. Yeah. Like, I just played a game, uh, at an RTT a week ago where. The Mo squad charged four things, and the berserkers didn't swing at all. Yeah. And I was I, I was killing five man sword bro squads with uh, characters attached. Mo was yeah. just killing everything. Yeah. And it's like he he's still gonna hit that squad hard. Maybe not mm -hmm. kill the whole thing. He'll still kill the character and a few things. But he's not one shotting Magnus anymore. He's not killing Angron and potentially Mortarian. And he's not gonna just swing a whole game with one combat phase. He's still very strong, and he's still going to punch pretty hard. Um, he just requires the right... He's like a tool. He requires the mm -hmm. right application. And yeah. same thing with everything else we have in our army. We have to start thinking of what was he killing, and what can he no longer kill, and what do we need to be throwing at that problem instead? Because mm -hmm. he's not just going to take care of everything anymore. Um, so I think... Keeping that in mind, we still have the tools to take care of what he was taking down. Um, world leader players just have to kind of look towards application a little bit more. It's going to be, it's going to require a little bit more thinking in your games and list building and being a little bit more thoughtful. But I don't think our power level is really that much lower than it was. Yes, we're up somewhere between 50 to 70 points. My list went up 50 points. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're still in a decent spot. I don't think we're sent to the shadow realm of yeah no, mad armies not. i don't think we're anywhere near that <laughs> and you know what we may not be 5-0ing we already weren't really 5-0ing that much but we're still a 4-1 army easy strong i oh yeah, yeah hardly I, believe I, that. I think so too i think the i suppose yeah we're, we're gonna pivot into like talking about the world leader stuff now and i think a lot of it is or a lot of the the sentiment at the minute is that people kind of feel like world leaders have been hit harder than armies like Craft World, armies like CSM. Um, I don't think that's necessarily true. We were certainly hit like relatively hard compared to others, but like at the end of the day, Eldar still lost a significant portion of different elements that they had to draw upon. You know, it's it's not like they didn't get touched. And I understand that people feel sort of like maybe it was unwarranted the changes that happened to us, but um I think a lot of what GW is focusing on here is that as 
a sort of newcomer to the tournament scene um facing up into world leaders without any sort of like prior knowledge of mm-hmm. the matchup is is rough i mean like you guys saw in my my game uh that was streamed at the lgt like that guy had yeah. never played world leaders before and that game was over in the deployment phase when i yeah. rolled that i was I'm going sure. first i've you had know? I'd ha- I've had half a dozen of those games too myself yeah. mm-hmm. where it's just like I'm going to score 100 points on you your table turn one and yeah. a half I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. It's and that's not a good play experience to have. No. It can be no. you know the, like for us you get you get that rush of like yes Angron <laughs> and the boys you know we've killed everything. But at the end of the day what we have to reflect on was like you know this is a game played by two people where mm-hmm. you're both supposed to kind of have fun at the end of the day. Um And it's the equivalent of like when someone brings a gunline army on a low terrain table and just shoots us off the board in one turn. Like that's Mm -hmm. not fun for us. So I think what we have to understand is maybe some of these nerfs were sort of trying to curtail that effect on newer players. Now, whether or not those are effective at doing that is an entirely different discussion. Personally, I don't think so. Um, Because I think with with specific list archetypes that are going to emerge now, they are still going to be extremely oppressive for new people to play into because... They didn't really tackle, um, I'm not going to say issue, but like our capacity to move across Mm -hmm. the table extremely quickly, which we can still do. And the potency of Angron, which is still very much a high level threat in the game. But yeah, let's let's start talking about the nerfs. And I think, Brian, you've already kind of brought up the glaive mode. This is probably the one that the most amount of people are talking about. Um, Obviously, his, his glaive has changed from D3 to plus one damage and plus one attack now. So that's really significant, capping uh, his overall damage potential. But then he has gone up by 20 points as well. Now, I remember when the last slate came out and Karen and Mo both dropped down to 80 points. Myself and Jamie were crapping our pants because we were like, this is so cheap for that unit. I think 100 points is still very fine for what this guy does. Um, and the Berserker Glaive, yeah, look, obviously it's a pretty significant nerf to it. But it's it's still definitely a good weapon. Uh, I think, Brian, you, you touched on a really good point that, like, you're not going to be one-shotting Primarchs, but you're still going to be taking out really significant threats in the game. It's just like his damage potential has come down slightly, but he is still going to be excellent against the vast majority of elite units that are present in the game right now. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, he's not going to kill a monolith, but he's going to kill a lot of other stuff in the game. So you don't put him into the monolith expecting him to do it. That's like kind of my stance on him. And the other thing that I want to touch on before I turn it over to you guys with the Mo is that um, personally, I think that the meta is going to evolve to include an awful lot more combat armies in the game. You know, we're seeing Dark Eldar come up, Custodes are coming out of their grave. Um, Eldar may start pivoting towards some of their other combat elements, like the Avatar of Kane is an absolute beast, which I think we might see a bit more of. And I think as those combat elements start to challenge that same kind of tier that we're living in, um fight first is going to start to become really valuable again you know it kind of fell off and we weren't really talking about it in the mo discussion because we didn't need to but i think going forward especially in the dark elder matchup if you've got multiple mo's on the field their go turn can be really problematic for them because they have to try and deal with the fact that their incredibly squishy combat units have to go into berserkers and a dude who are perfect for picking up incredibly squishy infantry units so Depending on the prevalence of Dark Elder and Custodes, I think we could be actually really valuing the fight first. And it w- genuinely would not shock me if in like three months time, people are like including two modes in their list, not as standard, but as a serious consideration. Mm-hmm. So on that note, I'm going to flip it over to you, Dan. What do you think about the, the Mo nerfs? Yeah, I think what a lot of people have thought is that, it, as, as we've kind of said in Discord, is that it... Some people look at it through the lens of it should have been rules changes or points and not both. And I think that really, we all knew it was too cheap. So it was definitely going to go up. That wasn't even a consideration, right? But then that doesn't solve the problem of the fact that, okay, he's now 100 points, maybe 120 points, whatever you want. Hell, you could probably make it so he's 120 up the glaive by five, you're still going to take it at 150 because why? Because he's going to one shot a primer. 500 so, point characters, so, yeah. <laughs> let, you know, it's let, let's not pretend like that wasn't a problem. And for me, I think that the Mo is sat exactly where he should be now. My only kind of, um, it's not even a complaint. I think the one thing that maybe would have been fair would be to drop the glaive by five points because essentially it's, con- it's one third 
as effective as it was. And I don't think that it warrants kind of that 25 point slot because even if you put it on another character, like say a demon prince, which is something that I actually quite like, I think that 25 points on a demon prince is still a little bit expensive. But the thing that is good is you're taking a really good profile and making it solid. Whereas for the Mo, you were taking an okay profile and making it insane. And I think that's where, I think there's still the value of the glaive, glaive there. It can go on other things. Yeah, I definitely, but, I could see it on a Demon Prince for sure. Yeah. Like I, I actually really rate it on a Demon yeah. Prince, to be honest. But, but to go back to obviously the Mo, and I think that another thing which a lot of people don't consider, and you've said it right there, is fights first is such a huge thing. But myself included, sometimes you just, you look at the list and you go, okay, it's got Mo and five Berserkers in it. Well, what does fights first matter? Because it's just Berserkers. But it's not always the Berserkers that matter. The Berserkers are just, they're just bodyguards. They're just hanging out. They're waiting to watch the carnage. The main thing about fights first is that if something runs into you, then it's trouble time. And I agree. I think Mo still retains a lot of his power in controlling and dictating the fight phase. The only difference is he's not walking up to Magnus and just taking his knees out from under him, which he shouldn't be doing in the first place. So overall, it was warranted. Might not feel great, but it was absolutely warranted. Yeah. And are are you are you still considering the Mo as a as a tech piece to put into your list on the regular or is it more of a choice now? Yeah, it's definitely more of a choice, but I think that's more for the sake of wanting to try some innovation. It will fall back on the fact that when he's not there and you have like a GSC squad of aberrants and their character in there, you're gonna go, man, I really wish that it wasn't my eight bound squad running into that i wish i could just precision the character out yeah. but it is also worth noting that even if you do do that the squad still gets the buff so the man wants to win buff from the character because all the attacks are allocated in yeah. one phase you're not, you're not exactly pulling it out yeah. at the right time yeah. so yeah. i think you're still going to feel it but the alternative is you say well i could take any other character like khan and just one cp heroic challenge right but it's still a use of cp and i think in a point that we'll get to later on i think that one that cp you're going to have to hold now for a very specific reason so i'll I'll probably take him out test a, a few games without him but i don't really think there's much more that you can get for those 125 points yeah so, i think we'll that's see. fair yeah so brian i know you've got a uh i suppose Maybe not necessarily controversial opinions on the Mo, but um, you've you've definitely got a vibe on him. So why don't you tell us what you think about the, the changes to Mo, changes to Berserker Glaive? Is he still viable? Is he in the bin? Where is he? He's absolutely still viable. Um, I know some people are a little angry right now, and they got the shelving talk going around. You don't need to be shelving your Mo's. Um, like you were saying earlier, Dara, there could be merit for a second, third one coming out. I don't really. Personally, I don't like having multiple instances of fights first, um, just because one fights first and two fights first for me kind of is the same thing. They just charge both, and they're just going to alternate sequence into both. Um, but you it, it, you still get to have it, the fight go down on your terms, which is still a big buff. So I do think having multiple instances of fights first falls off. Definitely the more times you add it in. Um, yeah, I think it depends on how you stagger the introduction as well. You know, if it's going to be like a multi-wave thing. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. But if your opponent's trying to like play around it, um, they they can try to get around it as best they can. Yeah. It's a mind game, right? It's like, right. Right, what are you going to present to me to deal with this? And then I'll challenge that and then you'll present something else. So yeah, it's, it's always and, a consideration. And the one thing that I also want to give... Uh, uh, our army or Mo credit for is that our army has zero access to CP manipulation, right? We don't have free stratagems. We don't have getting extra CP for doing X. Some armies have like multiple instances of both. Um, I mean, we have skull taker, but I don't really count that because it's a very conditional uh, and it doesn't even come up. You got to like work for that CP. <laughs> you got to, you got to work for it and, it and you're not getting it early. Right. So, that precision, like, I feel like all of the pre- characters that have precision just inherently are very underrated because he basically just reads free CP. Yeah. Like, do a, th- do a thing you shouldn't be doing that mm-hmm. should cost you a CP that you're not paying for. And if people are considering right now putting Karn in his place, which 
uh, is, I actually think, mm -hmm. there's there's merit to substituting them right now. Um, Karn, you're going to have to pay that CP for in an mm -hmm. army that is choked for CP because you're also going to be wanting to do plus one to wound. And we have other things we want to be spending that CP on too. We got a rapid ingress exalted eight bound that feels almost mandatory in any list. Pretty much, I feel like yeah. People say lists start with Angron Glaive Mo. I'm like, no, let's start with one three man exalted eight bound. Go. Like that <laughs> that's what I'm putting in first. Um so I think he's still very strong. I think he's a tool that needs to be used correctly, and I think if he's used incorrectly, you're gonna be disappointed with him. Mm. Yeah. And I, I think as well on that, on the Khan versus Mo debate, one thing which I am tempted to think is that. Whereas before, 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 before the Mo was very much a right take Mo, point at target doesn't matter what it is it's dead. I think maybe you look at the Mo and go right. I'm going to send him towards something that's you know got a tough character in there. And Khan, you can send him towards something that's you know a relatively tough unit like maybe some Terminators. And Khan will get more work done in that capacity than Mo would have done, because Khan has that little bit more volume, especially you've got Sustain and things like that, and each one's just a flat damage three. Sure, you've got the Dev Wounds from the Mo to consider, but if there's no character in there, I think Khan may even edge that combat out. I'm not too sure, but... It's I a think tough it's... one, because he brings he brings quite a lot of uh, a boost to the yeah. Berserker unit as well yeah. that he's attached to, right? And I think we're going to mess around a lot and it's something i love doing and i wish like i i think brian you, you mess around with it a lot but it was like that moment before the game where you like look at what your opponent's bringing and you're like how am i gonna swap my characters around between all the different squads here you know where it's just <laughs> yeah, like it's... there's going to be more merit to that now i think the modular i feel like the modular uh approach world leader players had especially the ones running the 1975 list where you have only 15 berserkers a 10 and a 5 Mm -hmm. I think that's much less relevant now. Um, you used like that was a really big strength. I yeah, I can wasn't you playing on this actually because I, I find this particularly interesting. Yeah, I wasn't playing the 1975. I was still playing 20 berserkers, 10 five five. So it was functionally doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Karn and Mo alternated between who got the five and who got the ten, uh, depending on the matchup. Now that Mo has had a step back in lethality and he literally can't one shot gods. Um, he can mess up chapter masters now, which is the level he should be at. Um, I don't see, especially people taking a step back from the 1975 that are like, oh, cut favor juggernaut lord, add jackals. That doesn't work because I think Karn and Mo both pretty much need to be with 10 berserkers now. Yeah. Um, oh, you okay. can't, you're going to be at a disadvantage pretty much in almost any of your matchups having. Mo with a ten man where he's bad, or Mo with a five man where he's bad. It's better just to have ten and ten, in my opinion, um, to really maximize mm -hmm. the benefits Karn's giving you. And now that Mo's with the five man, he's not hitting as hard as he used to be. He's probably not going to wipe most squads like he used to, just out of the gate. So you're going to be getting punched back. So you're going to want some extra oomph behind you to make sure you're putting down those six man aggressor squads with a character attached, right? Which is going to be stuff like that we run into or terminator bricks with characters yeah so i think custodes you know yeah. like mo with 10 berserkers they present a problem for the custodes and i think custodes are going to be on the rise definitely here in europe and the uk especially the uk every uktc event i go to yeah. i'm like why is there so much gold here you know <laughs> they love their custodes so much like it's literally every time i go to a uktc event i play like minimum two custodes players absolute minimum um and i think like you know, Mo and five Berserkers for a Custodes player is like, all right, cool. Maybe I lose the character, whatever. But like Mo and 10 Berserkers is like, am I potentially losing enough hitting power if I charge these guys that I don't kill them and then get bogged down in this really ugly combat that's kind of going to be difficult to resolve? So I'm definitely with Brian in terms of like moving around my layout of Berserker units to mm -hmm. accommodate kind of maybe two 10 man bricks now, which, you know, it's going to take getting used to because I, I did kind of like having a throwaway five, but I, I don't know yeah. if we're really going to necessarily have that anymore. See, my my view on that is that 
I think that if you start putting 20 Berserkers in a list, especially considering you're now putting Khan in there, you're putting Mo in there, that's an extra 40 points than what you had before. I think that the Berserkers, and of course you've got two Rhinos because Night Spinners still exist, and all of a sudden you're at nearly 600 like 600 that's, that's like 800 yeah. points 800, almost, sorry, 800 points yeah and it's like when you look at what you've got for that 800 points and let's you know being fair to rhinos rhinos are great for secondaries so if you're not taking fixed objectives those rhinos are still cash money like I, i've had rhinos score me like eight on behind enemy lines and, and stuff they like are that. my rhinos are signal cash. boys as yeah, soon as yeah, they yeah, dump yeah. i'm like you're going into yeah. a corner because <laughs> yeah. that card is coming up and you'll be there for it when it does and so it's it's like i I, I like the rhinos for that but then when i look at the berserkers and i'm not going to pretend like they need to be apt or anything like that berserkers are maybe a few points over costed but generally berserkers are fine my issue is that th those 20 berserkers i feel like take up way too much real estate in an army which we already know has now is definitely going to have issues with those armies that can go much wider than we can and so I, if I was going to do it, I would definitely go towards the 15 and do five with Mo and then maybe 10 with Khan because A, Khan gives you way more agency from the Berserkers, as we know. And the other thing is that, as you said before, Brian, Mo is now not really going to be a death ball that you just sweep across the field until he's done. I think that Mo is much more like a scalpel now and therefore I don't know if he needs those 10 Berserkers. I think you're going to pick a target get your Rhino with those five and go, that's where you're going. And if you survive afterwards, that's great. But he's nearly always going to make his points back anyway. So I don't know. It, it's yeah, one it's of those a, things. It's an interesting that's, one. It's, yeah. it's just nice and fresh that at least, you know, it's finally a point that the world leaders can at least have a debate on rather than necessarily mm -hmm. just saying, this is the best variant and this is what yeah. we're going to do. So yeah. in that sense, yeah, look, it's, it's an interesting change. I think we're all agreed that the... The Master of Executions and the Berserker Glaive, neither of them are dead and buried. No. Um, they're maybe a little bit fairer now, which is, you know, is what it is. And if you're out there maybe considering shelving your Mo or, um, you know, disinterested in bringing him to the table, give him a go on the table. Yeah. See how he does. Yeah. Um, I know I saw in Discord today, um, Sacco was saying that he only ever rolled a one on his D3 anyway. So <laughs> fundamentally, it doesn't change for him. And like, I mean, there's literally been a number of times that I've done that and he has still cleaned house, you know? Yeah. So like, yeah, it's yeah. fine. I don't, I don't really think it's it's going to be too bad. But so, sorry. Yeah, I, was just gonna, no, I was just going to say before we move on. So let's look. Why don't we like look at essentially what the profile change is for the most? So like, where's he gone? And like, where is he now? Because I think when you compare his profile to Khan, I think it, it kind of puts Khan in a place where you go, oh no, actually, like this boy has a lot more room now than what he used to, because essentially before, like what Mo was eight, like a minimum seven up to ten, whereas Khan is pretty much ten always, you know. Yeah, so yeah, I, I think that yeah. by dropping those extra two attacks, the most down to seven, Khan stays at ten. I think that the disparity between them is really where they should be because you wouldn't expect someone like the Mo to be pulling them next to Khan and being like, that only counts as one kind of thing. Whereas <laughs> yeah, Khan would sure. be turning around and being like, who are you? I'm sorry. Um, you know what I mean? So I, yeah, I think We, we that, want Karen to have, yeah. you know, his, his time in the spotlight. And let's be real. Like, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but like, I've been, I've been in this one since 8th edition and Karen has been hot trash for a long time so <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm going to rock the boy now. as long as I can um, but yeah so I suppose like transitioning on to maybe the other uh, mm -hmm. big talking point in terms of, of changes is the favourite of Corrin um, changing to once per game now I'm not going to talk too much about this one um, I'm going to turn it over to you guys because I actually haven't been using favourite of Corrin in my lists since like the LGT Mm -hmm. um because i moved away from angron and i personally didn't think i needed it and i will say in the like 40 odd games i've played since the lgt um there's been one or two times that i've been like oh no okay i don't have my advance and charge that's a problem um but i think the way that i play and how i kind of position anyway i don't like to go for that massive like slingshot maneuver a lot mm -hmm. of the time i prefer like a smaller uh sort of threat radius so from my perspective this is like a null change for me but I understand that for anyone running Angron, for anyone who's maybe relying on, on the, a larger threat radius um, or having advanced and charge up more frequently, this is significant. So let's kick it off with Brian, because I know you have a lot of thoughts about the favored um, and I'm here to hear them. 
yeah, uh, I'm I'm still gonna start this new season of 40k playing it. Um, I still think it's very playable, and I I'd even argue it's almost like necessary. Uh, you can certainly find yourself in some games where you feel like it's wasted or it was unnecessary. You just hit your advance and charge rolls anyways. But you're going to find yourself also in games where there's a decent chance you don't get advance and charge. And you don't get any icon rolls on the first turn that you roll because you don't control the objectives at the start of the first battle round. Um, you can just whiff a major game-winning opportunity because you just your blood dice said no and it's a decent chance it's like 50 40 percent chance that you mm -hmm. don't get what you want and being able to have a mulligan that can swing the entire game or it's turn five and you need this eight bound squad across the board now and it's going to come down to those last five points to swing the game and you whiff that it's game over and i feel like for the cheap cost of 20 points to make sure that you get that extra padding and don't have the feels bad that's awesome um so i really feel like the game is going to come down into like two stages right you're going to have setting up for your go turn then you're going to have your go turn where you're probably going to want advance and charge you might be able to get away with it depending on how aggressively your opponent's posturing um you can get away without it uh, with, uh without advance and charge um but like those first two turns you're going to want the option to have advance and charge on the table for you and if you just miss it the game just got significantly harder. And then I feel like we transition into the late game, turns late bottom half of turn two, midway through turn three, Angron's dead, probably. Um, maybe he's still stomping around if you're being conservative with him, but there's a good chance he's dead. And most of my games, I say, I think he's dead top of three. Um, and you're just in the thick of it. You may not need advance and charge for the rest of the game, depending on the board state. So it's going to be a judgment call, whether you just blow it trying to fish for uh, Angron or you continue to like keep it in your pocket. Uh, that I always said, feel like if you're going to use it to fish for Angron, it feels like such a bait now. You know, it, it, it is a bait. It's just if you think you absolutely don't need it for anything else. Yeah, I, I get I, that. I, if it's like I've got nothing else for this, right? And it's an yeah. it's a decision that you can make now. Now I feel like favored is just a decision that needs to be made. It's a little bit more skill intensive when you need to use it. Um, I do also think it changes the philosophy of how we play our Lord on Juggernaut. I used to just keep him in the back as an investigate signals. And then he'd also be back there to screen or protect from deep strikes. Cause he was usually tanky enough to eat whatever deep striked on top of him. Um, now I'm looking at him more as a midfield brawler. Like he's going to be the one running to go get area denial. Um, turn to like, he's going to be the one chasing down uh, the, my opponent's like peripheral objective to like go kill the five scouts um, that used to be like Invocatus's job, which it still is, but it's like I'm probably gonna start pushing him forward a little bit more. So, do you um, see yourself using the the reroll early enough in the game to warrant pushing him up there, or is it more like if he dies, he dies kind of a vibe? Um, I'd say like he's not gonna be part of my go turn unless I really need him for some setup. Um, again, it's gonna it's all situational. I'm just gonna be more comfortable putting him in the middle of the board because now he's not just this asset that just just source of infinite value now he's more of a one and done but after the go turn if i've gotten my advance and charged into you i don't really mind pushing him into the middle of the table more yeah um, and then potentially using him for an anger on reroll and if it gets wasted it gets wasted but he's got mm -hmm. a fantastic defensive profile and he's just lethal enough to bully off one wound models and scout squads and like he'll win those trades so i really like my philosophy on how to use him has changed um and i still do think he's necessary to just prevent those feels bad losses that are actually quite a high percentage chance to just whiff yeah for sure dan your thoughts on favored so for me initially i was firmly in the camp of favored bad i go bed but <laughs> After speaking to Brian and hashing it out a little bit, I think that my philosophy is definitely going back to keep it in the list. And that's for a couple of reasons, a couple that Brian mentioned and a couple that kind of, I think, interact differently, which I alluded to a little bit before. So favor, as you know, is just whenever you make a blessing of calling roll, right? That's when you trigger it. And I think now what you'll see is 
because it's not an infinite value engine, as, as Brian rightly said, what we'll do now is if you get your advance in charge, winner, okay, great. Um, if you're running Anglon, I think you definitely still need it because after all, it's a free reroll and who doesn't want Anglon to come back? But more than that, I think that now that we still have that one CP strategy for once you've killed something, deal blessing or calm roll, you can still interact with that with favor. So really, on every turn, on every battleground, you're still getting at least a chance for two rolls, and then you also have the favor roll on top. And if you're not getting triple six out of those three rolls, then I think it, luck was never on your side anyway. If I had to make one change to the to favored, I think dropping it points wise is fine. What I maybe would have liked to see is once a game, but instead of re-rolling everything, maybe choose the dice you re-roll. So if you roll two sixes, maybe pick up the other six dice and roll those instead. I think that maybe would have felt a little less like a little less harsh when you consider that yeah, ultimately it's an interesting one. Yeah. our our army rule is random and i think gw did a good job of keeping it so that it's not detrimentally random you still always get value out of it because of what's included in that table but if you have a random system as we all know mike pestle and said in the Goonhammer article if you're going to make a random system do you really want to be punishing players when you give them the ability to make it more consistent? Because as we said before, that's one of the things that hasn't really changed about world eaters. They wanted to make it. So we weren't always like turn one crashing into people. So we take favored, they go, you're using that too often. So they take that away. But then it's a case of, well, if you're going to build our army around doing that and you take it away, what do you want us to do? Because we still have to do that same thing. Yeah, it also so, doesn't stop that because, like, yeah. I mean, you know, the situation still remains of, like, if I'm presented with the opportunity to advance and charge half my army into the opponent's army in turn one and I have the new version of favored and I don't get it on the first roll, I'm obviously going to go for the reroll there. It functionally yeah. doesn't change that decision you know because you're still looking at a game state where it's like i can end the game in my turn in the first mm -hmm. round of the game like it doesn't prevent that from happening yeah. I, I would say so it's it's kind of it's a strange one i mean i like i said i, I don't really have like crazy high stakes in in favor um just with the list that i'm running but like yeah i mean is it overvalued for a once per game ability i would say probably probably at 20 points. Um, I like your idea of picking up the dice that you want to. I do think that if you're all double six and you pick up four dice, you're pretty much guaranteed to get anger on back with that, mm. <laughs> which is like, is a vibe, I guess. Um, but yeah, it's it's an interesting one. I think two of the two of the enhancements getting hit in a world where we have um, four enhancements, one of which is literally never taken and one of which is a niche pick. And then the two ones that are kind of always taken being hit is is rough um but let's be real with the amount of epic heroes we were taking anyway we didn't really have a particularly large yeah. amount of selection for actually putting enhancements on things i would have rather have the favored nerf be angron res capped i would have rather seen that because that easiest yeah nerf. yeah mm -hmm. yeah and and i think just to touch on that i when i when i saw this rule back in ninth and again in tenth this was always my biggest fear is that GW go, look at the cool thing you can do with Anglon, and everyone goes, hell yeah, that's amazing. Then you see it on tournament tables, at top tables, where someone goes, right, I've just plowed my entire army into Anglon, and someone goes, triple six, that doesn't matter anymore. That creates such a feels bad for the opponent that that design of it's very much all or nothing, it's like you that swing is like 830 points. It's crazy. 830 yeah. point yeah. swing, and I think to design a unit and also a game mechanic about bringing him back, I genuinely would rather not have that ability, and then have him be cheaper. Because yes, okay, does it suck when your huge primate dies? It does, but Magnus deals with it, Mortarian deals with it, Gilliman deals with it, Lion deals with it. It's cool to be unique. But we're now straying into territory where GW are going, 
we wrote that rule and we're not entirely sure if it was a good idea and now we're going to make you we're, we're going to like pair it back a little bit so i liked the ninth edition ver- version of his I resurrection because say, it, yeah, yeah. It, it it was resource based like you had to give something up yeah. to get it versus now how do you assign points to maybe he comes back it's so like, difficult yeah you, you can't really it, it's hard to balance maybe right it's easy to balance definites so he was much easier to play around and play with Mm -hmm. when it was a case of we both know at a certain point i will have the resources to bring this guy back but now it's it's very much as you said dan i mean like you can you can pump a whole army into him and then a swing state in the next turn or even potentially in the same turn like i've literally had um a situation at north et where i had grimaldus and the whole gang go into him he fought on death kills the entire squad i popped the blessing of corin thing um for the one cp and got him back and it's just like well that sucks you know um sorry i guess but try yeah. again yeah, yeah. yeah like yeah. oh you can't because your big break is dead because i yeah. fought on death and yeah oh well and uh-huh. it's just it's just like it's it's a messed up mechanic um i don't really think they've done anything to address that kind of i would say fundamental flaw with our mm. the design of the primark maybe it will happen in the codex um but that is a minimum of six months away at this point so yeah. we're still going to be messing around with angron and despite the favorite change he is still probably going to be in the vast majority of tournament mm. lists i think and i, and I think an, another thing as well which is I know this we've come straight off a little bit from favor, but the last last point kind of on on Angron is because I think by having him have that resurrect mechanic, they're really scared to give him the more interesting things. Like ev- everyone knows that I have a thing about the fact that he's the only Primarch without universal special rules. And whether or not you feel like there should be more or less of them, to have Angron go into a squad of Terminators. You know, doesn't even have sustained, doesn't have lethal. He swings in and he's going to drop a few, but ultimately it's that thing of you go, well, he's bounced off those terminators. He's probably dead on the swing back. So now I have to really hope that I get that triple six because essentially I'm paying for that rule. And when it doesn't happen, you feel like, well, I've paid for it. So where is it? So it's, it's weird. Yeah. I, I think really that weird. if you, if you removed it, maybe you could have a little bit more fun. You know, with the rules of Angron himself. But anyway, I digress. Yeah, it's a tough one. Um, So moving on to the last of the uh, rules change nerfs that we've received, and it's a weird one. Um, It's the Foot Demon Prince being changed <laughs> to an Invuln aura of five, unless they already have an Invuln, in which case it, it buffs up to four. Um, I probably feel a little bit more passionately about this than you two guys, even though I'm sure you feel pretty weird about it too. But uh yeah like that was like my jam for the last couple of months <laughs> i've been just... running the footprints as like my boy in non-grand lists and i'm just like i mean why though like why why like okay sure if you were well, running 120 you know jackals why. you had to deal with a back brace at the yeah, end of the weekend yeah. like yeah. 120 <laughs> jackals never did anything right like yeah it's sh- it but is let's like... be fair it would have happened it would have happened and then it would have been people complaining about it for so long. I'm I'm with GW on this. All they've done is preempt someone doing the thing, and it just creating a really well, sour taste in people's mouth. I, pe- I'm all people for have it. people have been doing the 120 yeah, jackal yeah, thing, yeah. and it's not moderate well. success. <laughs> it's like I don't yeah. know. I think uh, it, like, it def- at the it, end of the it, day, I mean, sorry, go on, Brad. I was gonna say you throw 120 jackals at the four up in fold and two. I don't know, a shooty night player, they're going to have a miserable time, right? But mm-hmm. 90% of other armies usually can just pile drive their way straight through it. Yeah. yeah. It it does feel like a little bit of a non-change if you weren't doing the 120 jackals, yeah. because like, uh, at least from my experience of, of running this guy quite a bit now, you just kind of have him buffing Exalted 8 bounds survivability, and it's obnoxious when you do that, and that hasn't really changed. So I... What I think is coming out of this, right, is that um, the, the people who've kind of knee-jerk reacted to the world leaders' nerfs may drop Angron or start considering dropping Angron and might actually find themselves running Demon Prince-orientated lists, which ever since I did it since the LGT, um, 
it's been really good for me. Like I've had better success at tournaments with without running Angron than when I have it, mm. just because it suits my style more. And I really like the Foot Demon Prince. I think there's a lot of tech in there that is yet to be explored by a lot of people. I think functionally on the table, it's a much harder list to play. Um, it's kind of like playing World Eaters a little bit on the harder mode because like, you know, you don't have the reliance of Angron or the fact that you can be playing with nearly 2,500 points instead of mm-hmm. 2,000. But if you get it right and if it suits your play style, it can be really, really strong, I think. Um, mm-hmm. And once you get the movement techniques down with the Demon Prince, having Exalted 8-Band running around with a 5-up Shrug and 4-up Invuln is really really difficult for people to deal with especially if you start hitting the no fallback auras and yeah i don't know it's it felt like an affront you know i felt like personally attacked when i saw this even though i don't really care about it but i was just like really bro like this was my thing and you're taking it away from me before it's even really seen the table it kind of confused me because this was supposed to be the internal balance data slate and if they were seeing that world leader players were playing too many eight bound and playing angron like the logical choice or too many jackals for some of the five <laughs> people out there uh, doing that. Um, I felt like berserkers were definitely the way to go if they wanted to open that up to make berserkers mm-hmm. a little bit more viable and indirectly hitting the demon prince also hit the berserker strategy. Absolutely. Just, yeah. yeah. Like there's a world like, in which it would have worked, you know, the demon yeah, prince and 40, 40 berserkers. 50 berserkers and uh, yeah, 40, 50 berserkers with yeah. a demon prince in the middle could have been a thing this like week we would be talking about but mm. I, I do think people are, are going to start really uh looking at the demon prince i mean the the people who are like dead set on dropping mo and his five dudes like it's the perfect slot to introduce a mm-hmm. demon prince right it's it's yeah. just the right points i think demon prince with the helm is like almost the exact same points as five berserkers and glaive mo um yeah. and i think people are going to be I say this from experience, from my own personal experience, and from telling other people to do it. People are so stunned when they see how durable the footprints with the helm is when he's having all damage. He's like, a satan. He's just a satan. So, it's a satan with the capacity, if you have the two CP, to reduce damage by another one. Like, you can take a four damage weapon down to damage one for two CP and the helm. It's crazy. It is actually I, silly sauce. Like I do think we're going to start seeing the Demon Prince more. Um, yeah. I was com- I was complaining a little bit about the kind of berserk, like sideways berserker hate, but contrary to what GW thinks, I think people are going to start running more eight bound, uh, yeah. just because the the foot lords for we have Dan's list got worse. in the wings here, <laughs> and we're, we're going to run more eight bound, and we're going to run. Some people are going to experiment with the. Do you want to see a demon prince buffing eight bound to a four up involved? Congrats, yeah. our terminators run seventeen yeah. inches. Like that's going to be what it is. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm I'm really. I'm really hype for the Demon Princes. My only thing is my two angry brain cells don't have the capacity to quite visualize how to use them effectively. Yeah. So I need to just build them and put them on the table. And like you said, Dari, you've got way more experience with the with this kind of list. But for me, or moreover, for you know, for the people watching, how are you managing? the movement with the demon princes the winged one it's kind of easy you just put him down in a corner and go you see that guy over there he's a con's the worst god and he's like no okay you literally just like he's so easy to use it, it's they're really polar opposites actually because i, I ran both um as i started i did the wing one with the the helm and like he's so easy because he has deep strike and he's small mm. so you literally just like wrap an aggressive man and be like next turn i'm gonna fuck your life right up you know <laughs> yeah and then I... the other guy is like unga bunga i have to move around this building excuse yeah. me that, <laughs> you know? that's the I... bit that's the bit that i go on Brian. sorry go on well, i was just gonna say there's, there's a world out there where somebody takes assassinate bring it down and your demon prince just kills himself at the end of the game and you yeah. lose because <laughs> you did <laughs> yeah. <laughs> happened to me yeah well i didn't lose that but happened to you it, oh. i didn't lose but someone took bring it down and assassinate and my demon prince killed himself at the end of the game and i was just yeah, like commit seppuku okay. and he's like i i <laughs> yeah. brought shame to corn and now i guess i deserve to lose the game for it yeah. yeah what i would say to anyone um and this is what i did to to learn the foot demon prince if you're curious about it and i think you should be it because i loved using him but um what you want to do is you want to set up a table you know just get out not even a full table you can do a half a table of of tournament terrain whatever layout you want and just put your demon prince down simulate a few turns of movement simulate you know plus two move advance and charge see where he can go what his paths are and once you work out his pathing because like he actually 
eventually kind of falls into a rhythm of, okay, I move here, then I move here. Um, you'll also start to understand once you start playing games with him that he can reasonably reliably tank a turn of shooting from about half an army and still live, depending on what the army mm. is. Um, if, it has, if it's Thousand Sons, he will die so fast because they'll just doom bolt him. Yeah. But um, most armies, yeah, he'll stand there. He's T10, you know, four up, two up, having all damage. It's very, very hard to kill. Um, so once you work out how to path him around the board and where to position your units around him, the return on the investment is crazy. Mm. Like, I literally had, like, at the end of a game I played against um, T Sons the last day, it was like him and, like, six Exalted Eight Bound just holding it down together. They were all I had left at the end of the game and was able to pull it out with those units. And I think there's a lot of value in him. People are going to start playing with him. I think the Wing Prince will actually be more popular because he's easier to use fundamentally. Sure. And I think people are going to put the Glaive on the Wing Prince um, yeah. because that that is also a choice. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're going to see him around a little bit more, which is nice. Yeah. And so, uh, if, if he'd have... Maybe, I think we all agree, he probably could have come down like maybe 10, 20 points on both, both of them. And that feeds into what you were saying, Brian, with, uh, you know, if it was about internal balance, you kind of would have seen that and gone, you know, they're on the edge of playable and a few more points off probably would have made it quite quite comfortable. But I think for 200 points, and again, like I said before, sticking the glaive, and even on the footprints, like the glaive on the footprint, sure, he's definitely squishier, but, you know, he's swinging like, what, eight eight times and he's got four damage dev wounds. Like that's it's not nothing like you you can't just walk up to him you know what i mean like and he's yeah, moving fast be a challenge yeah 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 for so. sure and he has a gun oh <laughs> yeah a gun, forget the gun. which is a vibe um I yeah, it's a decent that, gun too <laughs> it's not it's not terrible yeah it's like a weird heavy bolter um the other kind of like i suppose slightly indirect nerf to the faction is the changes to the rules around allying and demons now i know brian you you already had some thoughts around this um how do you feel about this this change and like I suppose, again, that kind of narrowing down of versatility rather than opening it up for us. I think on a competitive level, um, people weren't really running demons or really messing around with that beyond just occasionally you'd see like a Bloodmaster or Skull, Skull Taker just popping down in corners. Um, that's, of course, of course going to hurt that plan. Um, Bloodthirsters, some people were playing around with just a casual bloodthirster. Now you got to pay the blood letter tax. I'm sorry. Um, we're already like barely a playable index, and them just restricting what we can play even more kind of hurts. I'm not going to lie, even from like a casual table uh, impact. Um, I know some people are talking about like if I have to bring blood letters, I honestly, I don't want to bring blood letters unless I'm bringing them with something attached to them. Yeah. And if I'm bringing something attached to them, it's probably going to be skull taker. Uh, skull takers actually got a pretty scary uh, profile and he just got a points reduction. I think too, yeah. down to 85 points or 80 points. And people are going to look at that and say, well, he's basically Mo and he does like dev wounds and he gives me CP, but like blood letters and demons in general are just so fragile. Um, yeah, you overwatch them and like half the squad's gone. And, and half the squad's gone. And you're also now fighting the Exalted Ape Bound for their slot for the Rapid Ingress. That's right? a lot which, more important mm, to be honest which at is, that point. You, yeah. you, now you're like hurting yourself and your consistency because you, Exalted Ape Bound, you, you're not replacing Mo now. I feel like you're replacing your Exalted Ape Bound and Deep Strike. And. I've had plenty of situations too where I I've played Chaos Demons, and I deep strike in uh, Skull Taker with ten blood letters, charge a ten man intercessor with the captain or whatever, like jump pack whatever squad. Of course, Skull Taker is going to obliterate the character. That's what he's designed to do. He will just tear him in half, and then the blood letters will chew through another five, six, seven guys. Maybe they popped Armor of Contempt. Or they have a feeling of pain. They're Black Templars. There's like three, four intercessors, intercessors left. They're gonna swing and kill seven blood letters. Yeah. Like do you, you're not do even you're presenting not... your opponent with a challenge for their next turn. It's just like, well, I guess this is like you know, I, I always call it like the handshake combat, where it's like the outcome is basically the same for both players, right? Yeah, you just it's yeah. like doing a pawn trade in chess. Like I'll take your pawn, you take my pawn. It's that's what it feels like. And yeah. the real big drawback for me is stepping on the feet of the exalted eight bound. I don't like that. Mm. Uh, I think because Exalted Eight Bound will come down, and also they can 
drop a medium tank, medium vehicle. They can drop a medium vehicle pretty easily, or they can kill five-man scout squad. They can even throw themselves in a 10-man intercessor squad and do a lot of damage. Bloodletters are a lot more narrow mm -hmm. uh, for what they can deal with, and that just hurts. I think also, mm -hmm. just to add on to that, the brigand mm -hmm. nerf, people were already considering not playing brigands because we were talking about allies. I haven't seen a brigand in so long. I'm like, why did you I hit tried this it. dude, you know? <laughs> I tried it. I think if you're going to yeah. try that, the Forge Fiend's probably the better talking point, but yeah. mm. that's yeah. just my feelings for the Bloodletters and Skulltaker. If you want to mess around with it, I think it's worth it at least messing around with, but personally, I'm not putting too much stock in it. Yeah, it's an experiment that I think people will try, but I, I think ultimately will be disappointed at the outcome. Yeah. yeah. But... um. That is more or less the nurse. I know we've had the points as well. We've kind of inadvertently talked about the points. There's not really anything to say in the Exalted or 8-band because they're still phenomenal for their points costs. And we've kind of hit on Karen and, and Mo as well. Um, but without wanting to kind of draw this out for too long, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is uh, lists because list design may or may not change. Um, it's, it's obviously going to change some little bit for, for everyone, but... What I asked you guys to do was uh, put together a little bit of a list before the show. Now, um, thankfully, we have some diversity going on here at least. And uh, Dan, I think your list is, is particularly wild. <laughs> so why don't you um, why don't you kick this one off and, and talk to us about this list you've come up with and how it's going to play in your mind? Yeah, why not? So it's pretty much, you know, eight bound, eight bound central. So it's Angron, he's our log and save you. You know him, you love him. You don't leave home without him. And then you've got Invocatus, because if you're running 8-bound, you're running Invocatus. Of course you are. Uh, the Juggle Lord with Favor does make a return for 120 points. You could cut him uh, for something else if you wanted to. Unfortunately, all the 8-bound slots are now taken, so it's not going to be more 8-bound. Um, you've got 10 Jackals, purely because yeah, you need something to stick at your home objective. And if they survive... You know, a couple of turns, then well done, guys. You've cowered behind a ruin for long enough. And then the meat and potatoes are really um, three lots of three man eight bound, two lots of six exalted eight bound, and then one three exalted eight bound, and that's 1980 in total. So not quite the 1975, but I'm just squeezing out every drop of, you know, berserker infused with every drop of eight can do. Every drop of eight bound. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um... I think I think those last. Those last twenty points is uh in the backpack of Lara Jackals, I think. Let's say that <clears throat> it's a it's a pretty profound list. I mean, like it's it, it is very much a skew list. You know, let's yeah. let's not uh beat around the bush here. Um, there are going to be some matchups that are like really hard checkpoints, but then there's going to be some matchups that I think you're going to roll through as well. I'm, I I'm, yeah. Sorry, go on. No, no, I was going to say I'm doing. No. In fact, one of the things that I did want to touch on is this, is I don't know whether or not this list actually strays away from um, tactical and actually does fixed objectives, because mm. that's something you could potentially do. But investigate signals is more or less, it's not in my deck. It doesn't it's an extra CP. Yeah. Everything is just going forward. It, in my mind, it's a little bit, you know, referring back to the two angry brain cells, it's like, if GW are just like if they want me to do this, then this is what I'll do. You know, I'll just take the biggest bricks I can, and I'll just throw it forward. But, yeah, so um, when you're battering Robin Cordes or Stu Black in turn one at a UKTC <laughs> event, you can literally just look at them and say, "This is your fault." <laughs> <laughs> turn around to the camera. You did yeah. this. <laughs> yeah, I just say, imagine playing that list in like ninth edition Death Guard with the minus one damage. <laughs> oh. You better hope yeah. they don't get that detachment. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah true. true. Um, what do you think about it, Brian? Um, I mean, uh, about his list personally, it's going to hit hard and it's going to be very, very fast. Um, I still like fights first shenanigans. Um, so I, I, I still want, I still feel like I want 10 berserkers in a list too, because they are just uniquely good at picking up certain things. Like berserkers are actually pretty efficient into Satan. Mm, um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that would be kind of like my takeaway. Mm -hmm. uh, like what I would like to see in there. Um, and I'd like to see a way, I think, did you say this list doesn't have favored, right? It does. It's got the triple It, it does with have favored. favored. Okay. Yeah. And I, I, I was thinking about submitting two lists today and one of them was very similar to yours, mm -hmm. uh, Dan's. I was looking at a red angels list as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so I like it. 
um, it's something I could see myself messing around with too. Yeah, I think if I was going to change anything, I, I, you know, after the the discussions that we've had today, it is certainly worth like trying drop an eight band squad and you know stick the mow in there or. And and I think this kind of leans into something which we all spoke about before the show, which was fundamentally, even though we're all going to be out here trying new things, not really much changes. Like when I've played this a few times, yes, I'll probably end up putting the moments and berserkers back in with a rhino, and it's going to feel more homogenous as a list because yeah. ultimately, if you're going to a tournament, you don't want to skew too heavily. If you really want to push for that full for one you need toolboxes and you know this is as you say just literally about running people over and just hope it doesn't run into that person that understands how to stream stuff yeah i i would be confident in saying this list can like pretty reliably go three and two yeah. and with the right matchups could go four and one at a gt um i definitely think it would have a tough time into eldar and and crons but you know i mean that's not really much of a statement, is it, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I, I think Dark Elder would would struggle to crack it just because of the sheer volume of like, yeah, sure, you've got Lance on the charge, but like all my guys are T six and you're strength three mostly. So yeah. have fun with that. Um, like, sure, you're winning me on fives now with AP three weapons, and I don't care because I have an invul. Um, yeah. and oh, they're all damage one. I've got a feel no pain, so you know you come back down and and you slap into them. Um. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one. Like I say, I think it's a it's a really solid three two list. It's it's not really up my street because it doesn't play uh, in the style that I like. It's a really fast list and it wants to be doing its thing really early in the game. Otherwise, it's sustained too much damage by the time mm -hmm. it actually gets to doing stuff. And I'm very much like the opposite of that. I like to kind of engage in the turn three or maybe late turn two if mm -hmm. at the earliest. So um not that i have like a gripe about the list i would say but just that like i know i wouldn't be able to pilot it very well yeah, yeah. uh because it's like it doesn't work with how my brain works but i could definitely see it doing quite well and i actually wouldn't be shocked if we see that crop up quite a lot of people mm -hmm. just saying like okay fine i'm just gonna dump all the eight bound on the board because at the end of the day even with the points increase they are still one of and i i would still say the exalted eight band are literally the best combat unit in the game like mm -hmm. they just do everything mm -hmm. and they they stand up to so much damage as well yeah. so and, yeah i mean i can't yeah. can't really complain too much about it the, the last thing i would do maybe is as i said to you before you could even drop angron and i think that's what i would definitely want to try drop angron stick the two princes in there maybe have to fiddle some points around a bit but i think that that then gives you that little bit more of an avenue to survive a little bit longer yeah, and, you could definitely you know, slow I, play I think a bit that's more. the tipping. Yeah. I think that's the tipping point is where you take Angron out, put the Demon Princes in, and you've still got you know two huge bricks of eight band to deal with. Like it's not the same as dealing with Angron. It's kind of like Angron, but he can go through buildings now, and yeah. you know with the Demon Prince there, it it creates quite a problem. But yeah. yeah, we shall see. It's an interesting one, Brian. What do you have for us on this fine evening? Okay, uh, I can start taking you through the list that I uh, submitted. Um, I will say that uh, this list is very similar to, in fact, it's pretty much mostly uh, another World Leader player in our discords. Uh, it goes by uh, Ryan Bell. Um, I play a very similar list to him. I think we're just one unit off from each other. He's the original creator, if you want to say, for the style of list. He was playing this right before the end of the data slate, and I started messing around with it too, and I actually quite like it. Um, I'm on an Angron list, uh, and I am running favored. Uh, so starting us off, uh, Angron, uh, can't leave home without him. And we have Lord and Vokatis, uh, also can't leave home without him. I think those two are pretty, pretty solid, uh, to start off with most world leader lists. Uh, in Vokatis, you'll see in almost every world leader list, I feel like. Um, you can get away without him, depending on how slow paced you want to be with the game. But if you really want to turn up the heat early, or at least threaten that, uh, you're going to or threaten that turn one charge. You're going to want to have Invocatus in your He's list. Probably still. more of an auto take than Angron, I would say. Yeah, you know? like because yeah. yeah. he functions in a non Angron list as well. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I still have the World Leader's Lord on Juggernaut with Favorite of Corn, and I'm choosing to stick with the Master ex of Executions and keep playing him. Um, before I keep go further, like this list, uh, I'm definitely keeping Necrons in mind as I'm talking about how to. Uh, pilot this list 
um, because I feel like this list actually pilots itself really well into Necrons. Uh, next up, I have two squads of 10-man Jackals. I have a squad of 10 Berserkers to go with the Master of Executions, and then I have a, a Rhino, just to same same thing as pre-data slate, keep them protected. After that, we were going straight into our 8-bound. We have I have one squad of regular 8-bound, one squad of 3-man uh, Exalted 8-bound, and one squad of a 6-man Exalted 8-bound. Um, I think the 6-man Exalted 8-bound squad is still pretty much, like, best thing we have like if i can speak probably like the best damage output we have for like durability like bang for your money like there you go i think exalted eight bound um if you do it right on average pick up an a uh necron wraith brick still um if you uh, really? if you yeah actually oh. uh ryan, ryan did the math uh six exalted eight pound if you sweep hitting on twos mm -hmm. with um, sustained yeah. plus one to wound you're putting like 37, 38 saves on uh, the wraiths. Um, they're gone. Uh, that will kill them through the five up feel no pain too. Wow. Um, so I see and you're, you're, you you want to have like eight bound around just to make sure maybe you want to also charge with the eight bound to get the wound yeah. re-rolls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And just be there to clean up just in case they roll just a little hot. Um, but if you have anger on nearby giving you full re-rolls to hit, you have the eight bound there giving you re-rolls to wound and they don't have to be in that fight. Like they can be punching a satan to the right. Um, same thing. Mo on average with sustained and ten berserkers, even nerfed, can still kill a satan fairly reliably. Um, not as reliably as I'd like. I did it. Yeah, I did it when he it's was like, on, when he was on three damage. He he can do it. Yeah, he can. He, he can do it. It's like a coin flip. Um, mm -hmm. and that brings me to the last part of my list. Uh, I have a mauler fiend in my list, and I brought Ooh. that back out. Uh, dusted him off. Um. I feel like for me losing uh the master of executions uh I, I hinted at it towards the beginning of this video he doesn't just kill everything anymore and really looking at what you people were throwing him into what we need to replace that damage um needs to be something that's also a big heavy hitter um and I like the Mauler Fiend uh because I play a lot on GW terrain and I love playing on GW terrain I actually, I, I think those are the most balanced layouts um Having access to tank shock for six mortal wounds and then punching um, is like a good way to get around damage mitigation, like anybody's minus one damage or half damage, any of that. I mean, like, he's good into a katan, right? Yeah, throw a Mauler Fiend yeah. plus Mo into a katan, it's gone. Yeah, um, it is gone. Yeah. It is gone. Yeah. And that's why I like that. And I think a Mauler Fiend has a good shot at like killing another Primarch um, or a greater demon. Six. You take six wounds off of Magnus. I'm there's a good chance the Mauler Fiend can do the last ten. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I see it. It's fast. It's durable. It's a distraction. Carn effects. The difference between me and Ryan. Ryan likes that spot either being eight bound. I'm going to. I don't think the Mauler Fiend is necessarily the answer for me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to experiment with it being an eight bound, just like Ryan is advocating for running, or just another three man of exalted eight bound. Um. I'm primarily just trying to fill that void that Mo had where it was just kind of unfair damage output your opponent couldn't react to and tank shock is as close as you can get to that for me. Yeah. Um cuz I mean you do tank shock grenades, you can dump a whole bunch of CP in one turn just to delete something without even swinging at it. Yeah. Even if you have the Juggernaut Lord running up the middle. I've killed an incarn with tank shot grenades and a Juggernaut Lord charging and that's it. <laughs> Not even swinging. Like um, Avatar of Kane's still going to be running around. If you don't want to interact with it, you don't have to guys. So just Pay your CP. <laughs> um, that's kind of my list. One other thing I'd like to say is I know there's a lot of talk about like how many jackals is right. 10 jackals, 20 jackals, 120 jackals. Um, <laughs> big jump there. I love using my Invocatus to scout that second jackal squad. Yes. Up. Yes, you can 100%. use it. I so have been it's faced so with a 20, 20 man inner or 20 man crusader squad with a Judicar in it, right? What's the solution? Well, you just wrap them with jackals and charge them from the side. Yeah. Their fights first means nothing now. You wrap a rhino, a pop it, now they're emergency disembarking. You see some annoying nurglings in the middle of the table round or turn one. Jackals. That's where the jackals right? go. Yeah, it's oh and then you're still or, using Invo's move. It's honestly I'm I'm so with you on this. I'm so with And you. it's so underrated. And and if they're not doing any of that and they're just playing a just a normal tit for tat game. Um, taking those jackals and just shoving them as fast as possible to get on that second objective to get it sticky, get behind cover if it's possible. 
um, your anger on resurrections, if you're rolling two, three dice a turn, are going to happen pretty often and yeah, a lot more reliable. Scorched Earth, it's like the best way of burning the objective. Because you can just set up around the building or something and then be like, right, cool, the jackals are here. I'm not wasting anything in a future turn. I'm just going to torch this objective and it's just going to yeah. be fine. I think I have exclusively since, right before I uh, went to Worlds like in October, I've been scouting a jackal every single turn, of, turn like pregame of every single game I've ever played. Always yeah. scouting it forward or to the side. It is, they're so good. They solve so many problems because our trash beats everyone else's trash up in a street fight yeah. um it may be more expensive than their trash but our trash wins so it's good trash it is good trash yeah the only way it can be better is if you position a demon prince nearby to give them that little extra pip of survivability <laughs> or if it can Feels be 20 bad. jackals but yeah here we are um yeah it's it's a cool list man i mean i know it's kind of like a co-creation between between you and ryan um Ryan, who unfortunately could not be here this evening as well. He was he was pipped on the bill at the last minute by Dan. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, like, it's almost like a natural evolution of the 1975. You know, like, this is the the reaction to it, the development of it, which is kind of funny because Ryan, like, came up with this before the balanced data slate. Um, and then obviously you've modified it with a molar, which, like, I know people rag on you so much for bringing the molar, myself included. But, like, it's not a bad unit, the way that you phrase it. Like, yeah, it, it does a lot of stuff. And mm -hmm. I do think you're right that, like, the maneuvering of it is a lot easier when you're only trying to maneuver one of them. It's when you're trying to maneuver, like, three to four demon engines it's when things get a little bit hairy. But it's honestly not too bad on some and, terrain layouts. And the one thing I will say, like, towards right before this data site, there's a world leaders were everywhere. And I specifically in my local meta, I was playing in two RTTs in a row that were... 25% world leaders, 20% world leader players. They were everywhere, man. That extra squad of jackals makes the game easy. Mm -hmm. Being able to screen out another world leader player, it's, it, so it's heaven. You get to hit them just as hard as they hit you. Like, you get to hit them just as hard as they want to hit you, but they can't hit you hard because they don't yeah, have guns and they got to get through the jackals. They, yeah. like, and they have to keep their one squad back on their home objective mm -hmm. to sticky it. Meanwhile, you can afford to screen and sticky it's actually huge. Yeah, I agree. And I think in the uh, Dark Elder matchup, it'll be really prevalent because if they want to start screening their transports with, you know, whatever, X, Y, and Z, um, sending those jackals up early to just get rid of those screens or those infiltrators can be really, really useful there. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, it's a good list, man. You know, it's it's a pretty solid place for the army to be. I think it's... It's probably one of those ones like I um could go four and one can go five and zero oh at a GT. I reckon it with the right hands. I mean, it, it needs a really strong pilot behind it, but it has all the tools in the box to get what needs to be done done. So yeah, don't really have too much to say about it other than that. Yeah, fully agree. And I th I think that like we've alluded to through the conversation, that seems like more of the gen like general world eaters list that I would expect to see going forward. Because my list, it's very much a like mess around and find out kind of list. If someone said to me, build a list that you're confident is going to be more consistent over a tournament, I would definitely build something more like what Brian and, and Ryan yeah. are doing as opposed to this, so I, I feel like that's going to be where world eaters go. And again, it's not too different from what we already have. It's literally just Ryan and Pip down the head. Uh, Brian, sorry. And Ryan, both of you, technically. It's just taking out that damage that the Mo was doing that was unfair, and then putting something else in its place. And I also think that one of those things could be Khan as well. I think if you're, yes. if, I think if you're charging, and I think this also rolls back a little bit to Yes, I agree that the the two ten man squads of berserkers plus characters. While I might feel that that is a little bit overbearing points wise, I think that if you traded that in for two five man squads and rolled both of those five man squads plus characters into the same target, I think you would probably get a similar similar output. Probably going to be a little bit overkill, and there is obviously the chance of interrupting there. But if you're thinking I absolutely have to do the same amount of damage, that's probably one way that you could get around it. Yeah, and. Yeah. And for what it's worth mentioning, I don't think Ryan advocates for the Mauler Fiend. I think I'm just the self, uh, I'm the self avowed king of the Mauler Fiends. I, it's my trash. I want it to be good. <laughs> I'll do anything it takes to make it good. Yeah. Um, I, I know he was playing that. around with the idea of a Forge Fiend possibly being in there. Mm -hmm. Um, 
that is something that's going to need some play testing. I don't really yeah. think many world leader players on a high level have been messing with Forge Fiends yet, and I think they could come out. Yeah, um, yeah, they yeah. saw some yeah. for some points reductions. Um, yeah, I think it's possible. That, yeah. I think that will really depend. You'll see the Forge Fiends come out depending on what the top meta shakes out to be, because yeah. they could yeah. like if Chosen are running all over the place. Maybe it's yeah. Forge Fiend time. Yeah, I mean, they're good into the Dark Elder as well. Yep. Yeah. Devoting them to get rid of half of their army abilities. And I mean, they're not amazing into Custodes, but they're not terrible into them either. You know, it, it really yeah. just depends on a variety of factors, I think. Yeah. That's We're just going to have to see. Uh, it, sorry. Go. No, 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 go on. I, I was just going to say, because we're talking about Custodes, Mauler Fiends mess Custodes up. They do not how to ha know how to handle that thing. Um, wounding it on sixes and fives, maybe fours if they're plus one to wound, and then you just pop minus two damage and you just stare at them while their 400 man brick is stuck to your funny little lizard thing. Yeah, uh, it, <laughs> it's, it's, a vibe. it's and it, your lizard thing will win slowly, um, very slowly but, over many turns. But I mean, a win's yeah. a win, yeah. A win's a and win. I think another thing that's interesting about that strategy with the Forge Fiends is now that people aren't just throwing Anglon forward like in reckless abandon, there's an argument for, okay, well, you're not getting the rerolls 10-1, but maybe if you're being conservative with Anglon, you've got two Forge Fiends. It's not the most optimal use of like world beta rules, if you will, but it certainly presents a new way of looking at it where someone goes, wait, are those Forge Fiends on the other side of the table? And all of a sudden it's a case of, I don't know how I'm going to deal with that volume of shots being a decent profile and yeah. it's still Anglon that sat there at the end of the day so do you kill two Forge Fiends or do you shoot Anglon? It's not nothing to deal with so it's interesting, it's a tech piece for sure Yeah, They can't shoot all of us <laughs> Exactly Exactly. I will run you guys through um, what I'm playing with at the minute, what I will be playing this weekend and uh, curious to hear your feedback it's not a million miles away from what I've been messing with before but if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So I've got Karen, I've got Invo, and I've got the Glaive Mo. Um, no surprises there. And I have a Foot Demon Prince with the Helm of Brazen Ire. Um, I've got two 10-man Jackal squads, much like Brian. We already talked about those exact same reasons why I have them. And I've got two 10-man Berserker squads, which we've also already talked about, so that's convenient. I've got a Rhino, just one. And I've got a 3-man 8-pound and two 6-man Exalted 8-pound. And that is 1990. That is what I'm playing at the minute. Spicy. How, mm. how much has that changed after the data slate from what you've been running? So what this cost me was uh, the 10-man Jackal squad that was going forward was originally a 20-man Jackal squad, which was mm. so good. <laughs> it was so oppressive. I literally yeah. just shoved it forward and it was like, deal with this. <laughs> it, that definitely gives me like Arcoflagellant vibes where it's like... I was using Arcoflagellants as those guys. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's going to take 400 points of stuff to chew through my 150 points of trash. Mm. That's what Arcos feel like. Oh, yeah, I'm, Those, I'm those 20 glad. Jackals were there to do the stuff that you said and just give me the time to position so that then I just collapse. Um, yeah, look, it's, it's definitely not like an optimal list. It doesn't have Angron, obviously. But that's just because I'm like, I'm not using him. I'm, I'm kind of bored of that vibe. Um, I don't think you need him. I, no. I, I think with the with the favor change and yeah, yeah. with us losing those extra icons i think there's a real yeah. argument that you just don't need them yeah i think not optimal is the wrong way of of putting it now maybe pre-data slate that might have been but now i don't think so i think yours is an archetype that is certainly far more prevalent going forward than it was so it, it will be more prevalent than before simply because I it just wasn't really there before i guess <laughs> i don't think it'll be more common than angron lists no but yeah I don't think so. the funny thing is nongron beats the pants off of other anger other angron lists like I you have, can you just have, have that more anywhere. pieces <laughs> really yeah you just you have more so? trade pieces and that four up, i'm sorry uh, f and jet five up invuln on some of your stuff uh, <laughs> can good. make you a lot more durable that prince <laughs> is also quite good at actually hitting angron you know, he just kind of walks yeah. in and is like, cool, dev wins, whatever, go away. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I did find the mirror to be quite easy. Uh, well, not easy, sorry, it's still a technical game, but that I have the advantage. I have the agency there Absolutely. because, I mean, you've got the double jackal squad as well to just kind of be like, right, I'm going to do that, you know, that initial screening and stuff like that, the, mm -hmm. the bait in, um, because they have to present something to you to answer the jackals. They yeah. can't just leave them there. I was running a very similar list to what I showed you guys just now in an event last weekend 
and I was playing against another world leader player who had a demon prince, and I did not know what to do. I was like, "Why is everything so durable? I don't know. I don't like my brain just shut off. It was like like zeros and ones going in there. Like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? That... Like once you once you work out where, see, I think a lot of people are like, I want to use the demon prince as a guy who gets stuck in as well, and it's like, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. He's good. He's good at getting stuck in, but he's really there to be like, I'm a bullet magnet who doesn't die. And I'm also a guy who makes the exalted ape and even harder to kill. Mm -hmm. So when you've got he a just... position where you're like mid board brawling, um, like we'll say on a central objective and you've got the demon prince like lurking in a ruin behind like a wall. And he's just like, I'm here for the boys. That's all I'm here for. You <laughs> yeah. know, he's keeping shouting over the wall to do better. Yeah. And you then know? once it kind of starts going against you, like, it's it's the thing I love about it. You can put those exalted eight band forward into something, and if things start to go bad, you have the option to then bring in a demon prince mm -hmm. who is going to save the day. You know, it's an interesting counter to the foot demon prince in terrain and Marla fiend. Exactly. Yeah, I mean the Mauler fiend <laughs> is a problem for him. Yeah. The other thing that did change with this list was the regular three man eight band squad was a three man exalted eight band squad, um, so they had right. to drop down, mm -hmm. which does hurt because I love yeah. dropping the three man in in the back. But now I kind of gain that wound reroll aura as well, which is nice. Yeah. And I have an extra unit to scout as well here. Um, so overall, yeah, look, I'm going to play some test games this weekend, see how it shakes out. But personally, it doesn't really feel like the list that I have been enjoying playing is changing an awful lot on the board, which is mm -hmm. nice. Um, yeah. Now, how would it do at a tournament? I mean, I've gone four and one with a very similar list. I've won an RTT with a similar list. This one... At the right tournaments, if I'm on good form, I think I could win a tournament with this list mm -hmm. because I know that this list really plays into my strengths. Yeah. I'm not saying that this is like a tournament winning list that people should go out and copy. But if you're someone who likes a slower paced game rather than just going home on the first turn, I think maybe look at something like this. See yeah. how it plays for you. Practice the movement with the Demon Prince. Um, and then, yeah, see how it does in the wild because I think with the changes to the armies that were really problematic, like Elder really mess this list up like really badly because three spinners into this list is like okay cool none of my army moves because they mm -hmm. stop the demon prince they stop the exalted eight bound and it's like right cool i can't do anything but now it's probably going to be one spinner if any um and i think this list plays well into Drakari. yeah so yeah I, overall <clears throat> i'm pretty confident with this one i think and, and again i think it opens up that um maybe i'm just trying to will this into existence but i think it opens up the Having the juggalot in there, maybe even put the helm on him and yeah, then stick him with that. your exalted eight band. Yeah. And it's like, okay, night spinners, you might be there, but guess what? Like, I'm getting effectively twice the amount of move, like twice the chance to get the movement that I want. So, I did write not... a list which was invo <laughs> two juggalords, one with helm, one with clave, and ten berserkers, and he yeah. just full sense of <laughs> full sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what? Yeah. And yeah, I, I, I mean, what do you think about Darren's list, Brian? I think I kind of just gave my input there. I was like, I really like the Demon Prince deck. I really think it's good into other melee armies. I think that's like one of the best versions of world leaders you can play into other melee armies. Mm -hmm. Um, again, I think it's it's definitely a different take. I think it's completely valid. It's a lot scrappier, and it's definitely gonna want to like grind out the middle of the game a little bit more. And honestly, my favorite part of Warhammer is playing games that last five turns. So I'm here for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's stressful though, man. You know, <laughs> yeah, I've got nothing that can kill a monolith. <laughs> um, but yeah, we'll, Shake we'll your see fist how it angrily. goes. You know, we'll, we'll see how it goes. I am sort of in the headspace of like being willing to return to Angron at some point in the near future. If I I can't make this work in the new meta, um, I'm kind of at a, a point in time where I'm like, I've given him a break for long enough that mm. I, I will enjoy him again. But yeah, look, there's three very different lists there, right? And I I think they're all. Like, they are all good lists. Um, and it's something for maybe people to think about that, like, you know, while we have received all these nerfs, we're, we're still innovating. We're still trying to think of ways around it and what the meta is going to shape up like going forward. But before we close this one out, is there anything that you guys want to kind of, like, say before we, we finish this all up in terms of, like, you know, how you're feeling about us right now, the competitive scene? Like, are we going into a better or worse state than we were before? I... Go on, go on, Brian. I'll go ahead and start. Yeah, I, I, I think we're definitely going to take a hit. Um, I do think our consistency has dropped just because, um, I mean, the favorite hit is we're going to feel it. Um, we're still going to whiff on our blood dice, and we may be in situations where we use favored, and it just doesn't work out 
and now we paid for an enhancement we don't we're not using um i do think our army uh going up that 50 to 70 points we all lost one unit um on a army that was already pretty light on units uh we're definitely going to feel the hurt like if you're you we have to be careful right if we can't be giving up units for free it all has to be calculated and traded because just giving up units losing anything is is just backbreaking right now uh in our games even just a squad of jackals dying for no reason uh could make a whole game um and I think we have the tools we need to get through this meta that's coming up. Uh, we as players just need to really, really kind of put our thinking caps on and uh, really think about the application. Up, of I think is yeah, it's time to scale up. Time yeah. to scale up. Uh, uh, shout out to all the world leader players sticking to world leaders. We we're playing a hard army. Um, I do think uh, melee is at a disadvantage in tenth edition, and I really do think our army is not the most unforgiving army to play to mistakes, but. Um, it's it's going to be a very rewarding army to get good at and do well with. And Absolutely. I'm I think we're going to do fine into the meta going forward. We are not going to be at the bottom. We might be upper middle, maybe like low high tier still. Uh, we're still going to body who we bodied in those matchups. So those even matchups that get a little bit sketchier, but um, I think we can really step up. Hell yeah, done. Yeah, I'm I'm genuinely quite quite happy the way world eats are ultimately nothing has changed a great deal right we're again like we said at the beginning we're trying to change this round and we're trying new things and, and that's because we want to find something new not because we're scrambling to find something that's going to work the army's not broken it's not dead you know we've sure we don't have a huge roster that's always been the case since ninth edition it's not as if eight bound no longer work it's not as if invocatus has been nerf angron still as amazing as he ever was so i'm i'm excited for the world eaters i think that we're very much going to be dependent on what the meta is but as our most combat centric armies you know if you get something like guard who could just stick 80 guys on the table in rows that's going to be that's hard before the day it's like it's hard now you know so i think meta development is going to control where we are on the podium but i also agree with with brian that it's definitely going to be a case of we have to pilot things better and the largest thing that's probably changed is you're going to have to know where you were applying your mode before you're going to have to understand how you get around that problem now and for lots of i think for lots of lists especially anger on this it's just going to be turn anger on towards that thing as opposed to let the mo go into it and deal with it because he'll he'll sort it out no matter what the problem. So I'm excited. I'm happy to try the Red Angel archetype. If it works, great. If it doesn't, I'm just going to go back to what I know and we can continue trying. So yeah, follow the red path. Let's go. <laughs> yep, that's it. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I, I think you guys really hit it, hit it on the head there. Like, I guess the my biggest gripe is that the it really just feels like we don't have enough to play with in the index right now. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not a really a data slate problem. That's like a, an army development problem. We, we just need more units to just have the capacity to try new things that feels fresh and, and fun on the table. Um, and I think like my kind of like short enough attention span and like desire to play something over and over again um, is making me feel a little bit like lethargic with world leaders at the minute i'm just really mm -hmm. desperate to get something new into my hands to to put it on the board and, and have some fun with it um and like that's fine that's a problem that's a little bit agnostic from the actual balanced data slate i very much agree with you guys i think we're going to still be able to challenge gts i think we can pull off majors if we really really go for it um i think your average players are still going to be able to really comfortably go three and two i think people are going to be able to achieve really nice four and ones as well and have great stories to tell and overall, I just think that, like, if we try and spin this in the most positive way, like, we're not going to be idiots about this. Yes, we have been nerfed, but we're also going to be realistic about it and say the sky is definitely not falling. A lot of other armies have been nerfed. The meta has been drastically moved around and we are going to be playing into a very different game that we were playing three or four weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited. I just want to get some games in, want to see how things feel on the board and make some more decisions based off of that. But yeah, I think for now, though, we will probably close this one out because we've been going for quite a while. So if you stuck with us this long, that's really awesome. Thank you very much. But I just felt like it warranted kind of a proper discussion.
getting a couple of different viewpoints on um gentlemen you've been fantastic to have on though thank you so much for joining me and yeah it's been great if you want to catch more of myself of dan and of brian we're all in the red pot discord the link is down below so if you're not there you need to be in there um if you want to support us in x y and z ways patreon is the best way in doing it and there's a whole other host of things as well down below so whatever you see fit even just liking commenting and subscribing all the usual things um guys is there anything you want to say to close this one out no. uh world leaders redacted codex let's go let's go <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's, let's keep that hope going yeah <laughs> i think as always it's just you know the usual sign off our yeah. stay healthy stay safe kill, kill member. Member. <laughs> yeah.